Welcome to those of you joining. We're going to give everyone just a minute to log into the webinar and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's seminar. We're really pleased to have you here with us um, on this very gray day in Ithaca. This is the ninth seminar in our fall series on migrations. Um, we have one more seminar that will wrap up the semester. It will be at the same time on Wednesday, December 2nd. Um, and I hope you can join us then. We'll also look forward to announcing at some point relatively soon what our programming will be for the spring semester. Today, we're so pleased to have two speakers here to talk about their work on climate change and oceanic migrations. Michelle Fournay is a postdoctoral fellow with the Bioacoustic Research Program in the Lab of Ornithology. She's been here since she got her PhD in wildlife science at Oregon State University in 2018. And I, I will just say that I think her biography is this wonderful example of the strength of interdisciplinarity. So Michelle has a BFA in theater arts, and a master's in marine resource management, and a PhD in wildlife science. I think you'll probably see some of each of that in the talk today. Her work explores the ways in which marine animals use sound and how such sounds illustrate the impacts of human beings on marine ecosystems. Michelle is joined by Aaron Rice, Erin is a principal ecologist in the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics in the Lab of Ornithology, affectionately known as the Lab of O. Erin got his PhD in 2006 from the University of Chicago, and he specializes in fish sounds in coastal ecosystems. His work is very wide ranging, but it focuses on the ways in which the fish soundscape reveals patterns of community structure and also community change. So we're really delighted to have them here today to talk about migrations. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so, so much for having us. Um, I am Michelle Fournay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started because while it's probably lovely to see us, it is lovelier to see whales. Um, the project that Aaron and I are going to talk about today is very dear to me. Um, as was mentioned, I have an interdisciplinary background as an ecologist. Um, Aaron has been very closely training me to become a more careful biologist, but I am also a long-term Alaskan. And so in the research we're going to present today in the communities that we will talk about, um, these are both interesting from a sociological perspective, from an ecological perspective, but then they're also quite personal to me as as an Alaskan. And so um, one of the things that we will do our best to explore today is what that relationship is between nature and, and the human ecosystem in this part of the world. And so specifically what we're talking about is the impacts of climate change on how bowhead whales migrate. And we're interested in bowhead whales in their own right as an intrinsic 
part of their ecosystem, but we're also interested in bowhead whales as a subsistence resource for the Inupiat people of Arctic Alaska. And we are acousticians. Um, how I interpret the natural world is often with my eyes closed and my ears open, and I want to give you an opportunity to experience that as well. So if you listen here, Oh, it won't play. Well, what I was going to play for you was a really lovely sound of a bowhead whale. Since I don't have a lovely sound of a bowhead whale, I assure you it sounds something to the effect of It's low frequency. It sounds a little bit like a bellow, like you might imagine a, a dinosaur or something prehistoric. And while I'm disappointed that you can't hear it, I trust that you can use your imagination and imagine a world that is dark, that is cold, that is remote. And if you think of the tinkling of ice and the sound of things otherworldly, that's how Aaron and I spend our time as ecologists, is by trying to interpret things that we know are biological but are foreign to ourselves. And in this context, we will be listening not just to what the ocean sounds like in the contemporary world, but to what it's look, listen, sounded like over the past 30 years. We're interested in this historic Arctic Ocean so that we can track the changes in sounds produced by bowhead whales as we've seen climate change alter these ecosystems, and then ultimately to link this back to the communities that rely on them. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about the migration of both people and animals in the Arctic. And then we'll dive more deeply into the use of these Arctic resources, including marine mammals and bowhead whales specifically. And then talk a little about how climate change has been changing this ecosystem and how people are responding to those changes in ecosystems. And then ultimately we'll land on what it is Aaron and I are investigating for our migrations project, which is looking at how migratory patterns of bowhead whales have changed over time and how we can use sound to interpret these changes in migration. And so we'll start quite a long time ago. Um, back in the time of the Bering Land Bridge, people used to migrate east to west back and forth over a period of many thousands of years. And they would migrate along the coasts. Um, it took quite a bit of archeological research before we learned that these coastal migrations were in fact, um, the coastal migrants were in fact the descendants of the modern day Inupiaq and the modern day Inuit who populated the northern parts of Alaska. And then from these coastal migrations, these populations diversified and spread both east and south. And oh, quite a few of my graphics are not showing up. I'm just going to restart my PowerPoint and see if I can get that to solve itself. Hold on one moment. It's almost as if we hadn't just tried this. All right, we're gonna try this one instead. Okay. That should be a little better. But since we're here, let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, yes. Okay, excellent. So that is the sound of a migrating bowhead whale. And so civilization along the Arctic began at sea. As people went east and west across the Bering Land Bridge, they followed the coast to the north and also the coast to the south. And what we found is that these Arctic maritime adaptations, which included, among other things, the harvesting of marine mammals and the scavenging of marine mammals, began as many as 5,000 years ago. And these resources were critical for the establishment of permanent settlements in the Arctic. 
And it was in part due to the hunting of marine mammals that these skills spread southward and through trade routes and also advances in technology and hunting that more inland populations were able to also establish these permanent settlements. So in Arctic Alaska, marine mammals and other migratory animals, terrestrial migration animals as well, really did form the foundation of what became independent cultures and also cultures that interacted with other populations of people across this very vast region of trade. And that manifests today. So with the map that we have on the right is a map of indigenous peoples and languages in Alaska. And the group that we'll be focusing on today is the Inupiaq, who you can see at the very north of Alaska in the light blue. And that wide range that the Inupiaq people were able to inhabit is related very much to the coastal resources that follow it. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the northernmost point of north of the United States at the very top of the Inupiaq territory is an area, no, an area known as Ukiavik or Point Barrow. That is as far north as you can go in the United States before you run into ocean. That's also one of the terminating points of the bowhead whale migration and every spring and every fall bowhead whales will pass back and forth across that point. And if you look further down to the south and to the west, you'll see another point, which is Point Wainwright, which is the beginning point of where the Inupiaq people would begin looking for bowhead whales across that migratory pattern. So in the spring, they would pass Wainwright, arriving in Inupiaq several weeks later, arriving in Ukiavik, and then they would go further north into colder waters, which were productive, before turning back in the other direction for the fall. And the cultures who relied on these ocean resources separated from cultures that did not. But the trade of marine mammal resources spread throughout Alaska. And so even areas that are in the interior of Alaska and in the interior of Canada might end up receiving resources from the Inupiaq people as they harvested them from, from the sea. So we can find marine mammal resources as a form both of cultural interaction, but also economic trade over a very long time period. But this has changed somewhat in the modern world. Aaron? So here's a satellite view of that sort of same region. And I think one of the themes in both a changing Alaska and a changing Arctic is this increased industrialization and westernization of sort of these extreme regions of the US uh, and North America. And so here, if you see the satellite view, it's not only indigenous people uh, and Alaska natives that are um, utilizing the natural resources of Alaska. Uh, there's a number of, there's been uh, quite an emphasis on industry development as well. Um, next slide. And so here is a map showing all of the uh, oil and gas uh, extraction and exploration um, occurring in uh, offshore Alaska, both in the Beaufort Sea towards the east and the Chukchi Sea uh, in the west. Um, and you can see that, you know, these different uh, zones, gradations represent different states of offshore leases. The take home is that there is an extensive amount of oil and gas exploration. Um, uh, offshore exploration for oil and gas started to expand as oil became uh, uh, more and more scarce. Um, these areas are profitable to, uh, to drill and extract uh, energy when oil is about $150 to $200 a barrel. And so with the recent decline in the, in the, in the price of oil, a lot of this offshore uh, emphasis has been uh, decreasing, yet a lot of this the infrastructure for oil and gas uh, extraction um, still remains in place. And so this is a story too of competing interests uh, over different uh, and co-occurring uh, natural resources. Um, and one of the provisions um, with, the, with marine mammals in North America and, and specifically the US is that uh, all in US waters, uh, all marine mammals are protected by the US Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, which was enacted in 1972. Um, and so the oil and gas companies have to follow uh, this statute in order to um, uh, be uh, compliance with, with, the, with legal statutes. Um, but one specific provision within the US Marine Mammal Protection Act is an allowance for Alaska natives to be able to continue the subsistence hunting and sort of carry on these uh, traditions and dependence on marine mammals uh, as they have for, for centuries or millennia. Uh, next slide. 
And so, as Erin said, we've been talking about a reliance on marine mammals that's gone back for thousands of years. And in fact, recent DNA evidence um, demonstrates that early Inupiat people began not just scavenging, but also hunting major marine mammal resources, including bowhead whales, as much as 4,000 years ago and possibly longer. And so in these two images, these are actually both examples of modern day indigenous whaling. So the image on the top is a whaling team from Point Barrow, which has been, re not renamed, but the name has been reclaimed as Utkiavik. And you can see that the boat that they're in is made out of traditional materials, and that's called an umiak. And they do continue to hunt bowhead whales by umiak the same way that they have for thousands of years. And then the picture below is a mid-century picture, which is also taken in Utkiavik or Point Barrow, where they were harvesting a bowhead whale. And the harvest of a single bowhead whale is a cultural and economic focal point for Inuit communities throughout both Alaska and Northern Canada. And even though a whaling team will have rights to certain parts of the whale, it's never bought or sold with, with currency. It is always either traded or given away. And so when a single whale is caught, it's split into three pieces based on um, on the whaling team itself. There's the tail end of the whale, which is reserved for the whaler with the flukes being specifically given to the man who harpoons the whale. Um, the back end of the whale is reserved for the whaling team and their community. And the front end of the whale is meant to be shared and traded beyond the community. And these cultures have persisted for a very long time. And without the whale, there's actually a, a real danger, not just of losing, um, cultural practices, but also nutritional practices. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in just a moment. And their reliance on migratory whales was um, facilitated by the actual ecology of the bowhead itself. Because they do this east-west migration, there are two times annual at each location in the northern parts of Alaska where bowhead whales come very close to shore. And that means that with this predictable migration, that communities were able to stay put instead of having to follow the whale by taking a whale in the spring, that was more than enough resource to survive a community until the fall when the whale would return. Similarly, bowhead whales are a solitary creature. And while initially this might seem counterintuitive for a community that is trying to maximize its resources, if there were large pods of bowhead whales, the ability of a small team of hunters to interact, engage, and to successfully capture one would be negligible. Bowhead whales are upwards of 65 feet long. That's a school bus and a half. And they weigh as much as 65 tons. So it's an enormous animal large groups of animals like that would be extremely dangerous to a team of whalers. Um, and for our purposes, it's also important to note that bowhead whales are highly vocal. And Inupiat whalers and community members have mentioned to me in conversations about times when in early spring, if whalers could not see the whales from the leads in the ice, they would go and they would put their ear against the ice and they would listen for them. And this is true for several marine mammal species in the Arctic. And this ultimately ended up being a very powerful tool for us as biologists for tracking these animals um, underneath the ice. And lastly, and importantly, bowhead whales are extremely long lived. This is an animal that can live to be anywhere from 200 to 300 years old. What that means is that it is not only possible, but plausible that there are bowhead whales in Alaska right now who have been swimming in the Beaufort Chukchi Sea for longer than the existence of the United States of America, longer than industrial whaling ever actually profited in that area of the world, um, and certainly longer um, than any or I, you, you or I, or potentially any community members in, in Ukiavik today have been alive to listen to them. Erin? And so understanding the seasonal dynamics and, and locations of, of whales has been immensely important um, for both uh, the uh, Inupia as well as um, the regulatory bodies such as the U.S. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service that has oversight over uh, populations. And so this sort of schematic kind of shows where this population of whales migrates uh, throughout the year. So um, in the winter, they're down sort of more southerly in the Bering Sea uh, and then the southern end of the Chukchi. Uh, and in the spring, the whales migrate north and east across Point Wainwright, across Barrow. In the summer, they're primarily in the Beaufort Sea, a little bit around Point Barrow, um, and then in the fall, make their way back again. Uh, next slide. 
And so for decades, that migratory route has sort of been summarized with this sort of schematic where it's this east to west, north to south, regular pattern of migration where the animals are presumably using uh, different environmental cues, whether changes in temperature or changes in sea ice coverage uh, to time their, uh, their migrations. Uh, next slide. And this is important because both traditional values as well as, as Aaron mentioned, regulatory bodies have really hung their hat on the predictability of this migration. But in 2019, the migration was two months late. Um, bowhead whales also swam further offshore than ever in recorded history. And come July, when the spring migra migration functionally didn't happen, um, people were really beginning to worry that the bowheads might not appear at all. And there was a question about whether or not this was related to climate change. 2019 was the warmest summer on record in Alaska, with temperatures in the interior of Alaska exceeding 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, there are often high temperatures in the interior of Alaska, but this also radiated outward to the coast in unprecedented ways that have not been recorded in human history or modern history. And there was a real fear in the community that if the whales didn't arrive soon, that these villagers and that these villages might go hungry. And that's largely because even though bowheads are in large part a symbolic resource, members of Northern Alaskan communities, approximately 30% of their diet is made up of subsistence foods, including seals, fish, caribou, berries, different seaweeds, and bowhead whales. On any given year, the bowhead whale might actually make up 60% of all of the protein in that subsistence diet. Now that's an enormous amount of calories that's needed for this community. And when we sent around some reading for people to consider before listening to this lecture, um, there was one NPR article that I thought did a really nice job about explaining why subsistence foods are so important to this community. And partially it's cultural, Partially it's nutritional, but then it is also largely economic. The remoteness of this area makes it very difficult to keep the price of modern foodstuffs low. And so even though there is the availability of things like Oreo cookies and gallons of milk, a gallon of milk might run as much as $14 a gallon, and a box of Oreo cookies might actually run as much as $21 a box. And so even if communities didn't have the subsistence resources, that does not necessarily mean that they will have the cash available on hand to get the nutrition that they need. So the change in this migration was something that we need to keep an eye on both in terms of how to manage bowhead populations, but also how to make sure that the Inupiat um, culture and also villages can survive in the face of a rapidly warming Arctic. And what happened in that 2019 was exactly what you might have expected. With two months delay in the migration and bowhead whales moving far offshore, we were starting to get into winter weather by the time the fall migration came around. So instead of an October migration, which is the time when the water is usually calmer, when the leads are usually still tucked close. And when I say lead, I'm talking about pack ice. Um, when you have open flows of ice, it's very dangerous to take a boat. It's much easier to follow small cracks on the ice as if they were rivers while that ice is held fast. But later in the season, as our, our oceanographic variables begin to change, the ocean gets too dangerous for our whalers to go out and to hunt. And so in 2019, we had the lowest number of bowhead whale catches, so the number of animals actually returned to the community since the 1970s when there was a moratorium put on, um, on indigenous whaling in the north of Alaska. And all of this was related to that shift in migration in 2019. And this reliance on whales has only just recently rebounded. And there's a big difference between industrial whaling, which was the mass removal of whales worldwide, and Inupiat whaling or indigenous whaling. And it was fairly late in the game when industrial whaling made its way into the northern parts of the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. In the 1940s, there were approximately 20,000 bowhead whales that were going through those migratory routes that Aaron showed you. Industrial whalers came in and based on whaling records, it's estimated that they killed up to 19,000 of them. Prior to the removal of those whales, Inupiat populations and Inuit populations along the Beaufort-Chukchi coast were thriving. 
as that population of whales was decimated, those communities began to starve and both humans and the Inuit were on the verge of collapse. In 1977, the IWC, the International Whaling Commission, put a ban entirely on Inuit whaling because of the low numbers of bowhead whales. But there was a really interesting discrepancy. Every year, whalers would go out to the ice edge, and in order to maintain their own hunt, they would count how many whales they saw. In 1977, when the International Whaling Commission put a ban on indigenous whaling in the high Arctic, they did so claiming that there were only 300 bowhead whales left in the population. But Inuit whalers had observed what they estimated to be closer to 3,000 whales in the population. And given the reduction in the size of the communities and the introduction of Western foods, they believed that by taking only a small number of whales, the population would rebound. They got together, looked at, um, at their internal numbers, and then also looked at their long-term traditions and used something that's called traditional ecological knowledge, which I imagine you've heard quite about in the seminar series. And they said, based on their system of traditional ecological knowledge and known history, that they believed they should be allowed to self-manage their population, that they thought there were 3,000 whales, not 800 whales, and that by relying on their traditional methods, they would continue to see an increase. And then in 1981, they formed the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission to both collaborate with and also to, in some ways, challenge the management of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Marine Fisheries Service. But in 1981, NOAA did agree to this collaboration, provided that the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission would honor the census, the count for the number of whales, and to honor take quotas, which is the number of animals that they were allowed to strike every year. And even though there had been quite a bit of conflict prior to this with the census not being believed by the Inupiat people and with take quotas being seen as an infringement of village rights, they did agree to this. And what the North Slope Borough, which is the borough that manages whaling and also the town of Barrow or Ukiavik in the far north, did was that they decided that rather than fighting with traditional scientists, they were going to team up with researchers and conduct their own census. And as a co-government body, their census would have to be legally recognized. The first census were done via airplane in the 70s, again, starting in 1977, and they were having a hard time counting the whales. And the numbers that the IWC had proposed, that 800 number, looked a little more robust if you only included the number of whales seen by airplane. However, I did mention that the people of Utkiavik knew that these animals made a lot of noise, that you could hear a bowhead whale. And so they teamed up with researchers from Cornell, actually, from what was then the Bioacoustics Research Program, but is now the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics, to include both a visual count of bowhead whales and to include an acoustic count of bowhead whales. And by empowering the community who had a slightly better eye for finding whales than scientists who did not have the experience to stand on the ice and find whales, when they looked at this much more robust sampling method, it confirmed what they knew all along. There were about 3,000 whales that were in that ocean. And that formally codified the positive relationship of co-management between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the folks of the North Slope Borough and the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. And I'm happy to report that even though there has been an annual take along the northern coast of Alaska, that bowhead whales are one of the fastest growing population of whales, world, of whales worldwide, at least between 1980 and 2010. But the Arctic is changing. In 1980, when we saw that vast rebound of whales, we still had quite a bit of sea ice. And human-driven climate change is increasing global ocean temperatures. And as a result, sea ice is melting earlier, it is thinner, and we are seeing different types of ice. And as a result, we're seeing a shift in marine ecology, both in the Alaskan Arctic, as well as in the Antarctic, as well as in the Greenland Arctic. And this manifests not just in what we can see from satellites. This is more than just what we can count with a CTD. We can also detect these shifts in ecology in the ocean soundscapes. 
Sea ice has declined by approximately 72% since 1980 when the first acoustic census was added to monitor bowhead whales along the Alaskan Arctic. Currently, there are projections of an ice-free summer in the Arctic by 2040. And you can see in these two figures on the lower right that in 1984, we still had a significant amount of summer sea ice left in September, which is generally considered to be our sea ice minimum in the Arctic summer. The same time period in 2012, you can see that the Alaskan Arctic is functionally sea ice free. And in the plot on the top, you can see that at 2019, 2019 and 2012, we had near record low numbers for our daily sea ice extent, falling outside the normal range of error for the averages between 1981 and 2010. And this does have a cycling effect. Um, the less sea ice there is, the faster the sea ice melts. And so it does appear that we have only recently tipped the scales and our melting of sea ice is only going to um, exponentially increase rather than stabilizing with time. And ultimately, this changes a lot of things. Um, it clearly changes the environment. Um, this means that our habitat will shift. So pagophilic ice-loving animals in the high Arctic, like ice seals, also a subsistence resource, are lacking in habitat. Polar bears, of course, are the poster child for this. But then we also see changes in microfauna in our planktonic communities. Um, the underside of sea ice is an area where we often see algal growth and we have the accumulation of biofilms, which then provides a food source for small planktonic creatures, which then form the bottom of a food web for fish, ranging all the way up to our large whales. But as we lose sea ice, we're also seeing a change in the community composition of our megafauna, as we have predators like killer whales that typically would stay away from the northern areas due to ice um, coming in and beginning to predate things like seals and potentially also whale calves. But then we also have a dramatic increase in human activities. Uh, we have areas that were previously um, unreachable as a function of ice are now opening. And so I assume that most people have heard of the famed Northwest Passage, this concept that you could go over the top of North America, over the Arctic in an ice-free summer. And we are very quickly getting to that point, which also opens this area up for oil and gas development, tourism, and shipping all of which will put an enormous amount of anthropogenic noise into our environment. And all of these things change how the ocean sounds. And so one of the things that our lab group does and sort of this, the staple of our research uh, within the program for the last uh, going on 30 years uh, is this idea of what is referred to uh, in the field as passive acoustic monitoring. So you can imagine that, you know, in the 1970s and early 1980s, what uh, scientists would do is they would take their hydrophone drop it into the water on the ice edge, have a pair of headphones, and they would listen for passing whales and creaking ice and those kinds of things. And, and the recordings were limited to, you know, maybe an hour, maybe a couple hours, pretty much whatever would fit on an analog, uh, you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape at that time or a cassette. Uh, now, with, its, uh, with the explosion in uh, digital technology, with these individual sensors, we're able to basically, you know, deploy what is essentially a packaged computer with a hydrophone at the bottom of the ocean, and it can record for mo uh, for months, sometimes years, uh, yielding uh, an immense amount of data. Um, so, you know, our lab uh, right now has about uh, 10 million hours of underwater audio collected over the last 30 years, and even within these individual projects that are, you know, may last two to three years in duration it's coming back with decades upon decades of sensor hours of audio. So these projects result in large scale audio such that you couldn't, you know, uh, you, we collect more sound uh, than uh, an individual could listen to in a lifetime. And so what, the, what has changed um, with passive acoustic monitoring over the last couple of decades, and particularly in the last 10 years, is how do you take what was originally a very sort of uh, sensory interactive science where you could listen to it or you could look at a spectrogram and now we're sort of in this domain of big data where we're using AI, we're using uh, high performance computing to mine through sounds uh, to look at these large patterns. So what it, the way this process kind of works is uh, all of the, you know, we will deploy recorders in a particular uh, swath of the ocean. They will do their thing for many months. They'll come back and, uh, you know, the what used to be hard drives are now SD cards come back to the lab. Data are extracted and then we'll use uh, a number of uh, custom developed software platforms um, using uh, that employ either AI approaches or, or visual recognition 
um, to, to look through those sounds. And where they, a lot of the AI comes in is being able to train the computer to look at species specific uh, sound components, such that if you see these identified whale sounds, these little cartoons uh, are sort of these species specific images from the spectrogram or a visual representation of sound as frequency versus time um, here shown as cartoons, where the computer is basically looking for patterns that look like this. Uh, and from this, go ahead and next slide. We can start building these uh, temporal and spatial records of occurrence. So within each of these uh, sounds, uh, you can see there's that little uh, parenthetical note of plus metadata. One of the really salient components of the, of the data stream for us is where and when those uh, sounds were detected. And so from that on individual sensors, uh, we can build long term records of uh, patterns of occurrence of animals, or if we have a large scale sensor network covering a, a, a large geographical expanse, we can start to build sort of distribution maps uh, of whales in, in different areas. Next slide. And so two recent examples that we've done uh, on the Atlantic coast with North Atlantic right whales. Uh, this panel is shows uh, data um, with sort of the time series component of change over time with whales at a particular location. So this is a sensor network off of Massachusetts Bay. And what you can see with the occurrence of right whales is a shift in their migratory patterns, both in the onset and duration of those migrations. So this is a specific location, next slide. But we can also then use a distributed sensor network here shown across the entire Atlantic coast where we can look at the relative abundance of detection days of uh, North Atlantic right whales uh, in a particular season. And so we can have really good resolution with respect to space or really good uh, resolution, data resolution uh, with respect to time. And so uh, with these examples here uh, showing what we've done in North Atlantic right whales, um, we can take these similar approaches and, and apply them to understanding bowhead dynamics. Next slide. So a couple of recent, there's been increasing effort and in increasing lab groups working on uh, sort of passive acoustic monitoring of bowheads around the Alaskan Arctic. So in uh, 2010, um, uh, NOAA convened a working group uh, called the Synthesis of Arctic Research with investigators at six or seven different US and Canadian institutions, all with different uh, sensors in the water. And so these uh, uh, recorders were not deployed or it wasn't an experimental design to look at sort of a holistic uh, movement across the, the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. But uh, what emerged from that was this idea of, oh, wow, we can actually take a fairly uh, large expanse of the, uh, of the Alaskan Arctic and look at bowhead dynamics uh, across this range. Uh, next slide. And so with these data, so these colored bars uh, correspond to the color of the sensor on the map. But what you can see is um, how the, the bowhead whale moves uh, throughout the year. So the vertical uh, on the y-axis is the sort of the proportion of bowhead detections on any given day. The colors correspond to location. And then on the x-axis, you have month going from uh, August of 2009 to October uh, through October of 2010. And you can see basically where the whales move their, over the course of the year, move their way east uh, or fr uh, west from the east and then go back uh, to those more easterly locations um, in the Beaufort Sea. And so what we see is this sort of cyclical pattern of bowhead migration within this year long snapshot. And this was really the first time this high level uh, synthesis of, um, of bowhead movements using passive acoustics had been undertaken. Next slide. And so to sort of zoom in on what some of those data might look like, um, if you wanted to actually visualize those sound, Aaron showed you an example earlier of what we call a spectrogram. A spectrogram is just a, a picture of sound. Uh, you have time along the x-axis and frequency or pitch along the y-axis. And so one of the things that we have done for the Beaufort area and where we will do this for every year of our data is we make what are called long-term spectrograms. And that's what we have up in front of us. And here I use the examples of 2010 and 2011. 2010 was a low ice year and 2010 was a high ice year. And this manifests in the acoustic habitat. So you can see in 2010 between May 2nd and May 26th, there's a lot of blue. That indicates that very low sound, that it was quiet during that time period. Meanwhile, um, the following year, we have these sort of yellows and reds and greens for the entire duration. 
And that's because we didn't have any ice cover earlier in that 2010 period. And we had what presumably was a later onset of income migratory animals. Around that June 7, 2010 mark, you can start to see choruses. Those choruses are a combination of bowhead whales, ring seals, and ribbon seals. Whereas in 2011, those choruses started much earlier. Now, partially this has to do with the fact that the seals themselves are actually driving the habitat. Seals rely on sea ice for mating and pupping. And what that means is in the absence of sea ice, you get lots of blue, lots of quiet. And in the presence of sea ice, it's much noisier. We're not entirely sure yet what the relationship is between sea ice and bowhead whale migration. That's a big part of what this research is trying to find out. But to zoom in even more closely, this is a spectrogram of bowhead whale song. So again, we have time against pitch or frequency. And the louder something is, um, the brighter it will be. So I'll play this for you. I'm going to pause it for just a second because what you're actually hearing is several species. Those Marvin the Martian sounds that you're hearing in the background are bearded seals. That that you heard at the beginning was a ribbon seal. But all of these little double U's and throps and thwops, those are bowhead whales. So I'll start it over and see if you can hear the different species. I won't play the whole thing, but I do encourage you to look up Bowhead Whale Song. It's quite extraordinary. And that's a sort of a remarkable cultural thing all on its own. It's very well known that humpback whales sing. Roger Payne made an album about it. It was a bestseller. Um, here at Cornell just last year, I believe, um, Katie Payne and Annie Lewandowski did an entire um, musical concert where they matched the sound of the Cornell Bell Tower with the song of humpback whales. And so that has been something which has pervaded human culture, this concept that humpback whales sing. But bowhead whales also sing. Their songs are equally as elaborate. They're also culturally transmitted, but they receive far less attention. And partially that's just because of the remoteness of the species, but also because unlike humpback whales whose songs are repetitive and fairly easy to hear, bowhead song has actually been related to something a little more like jazz and that from time to time the bowhead whales will improvise and this song is believed to serve some sort of reproductive function though the exact function isn't known in addition to song though bowhead whales will also produce a suite of non-song vocalizations contact calls navigation calls um calls between cows and calves but because of the difficulty in observing bowhead whales under ice, even though we have a fairly well-defined understanding as to what bowhead whales sound like, we actually have a fairly poor understanding as to why bowhead whales make the sounds that they make. Which means for now, we can identify them, but we're still working on trying to figure out specifically what the animals are doing when they hear. But the fact that they are so vocal does make it really easy for us to detect them under the ice when it might otherwise be difficult, if not impossible, to watch them from above the ice. And so we've been listening at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics in collaboration with the North Slope Borough and the, the town of Ukiavik for a very long time. And that's what is enabling us to do the research that we're doing now. So in this plot on the top, you can see all of the different years and months that we have recordings of. And anywhere where we have these blue horizontal bars, we have not analyzed our data yet. No one has actually listened to or gone through and annotated these for bowhead whale calls. The pink areas we have. We have had technicians who have gone through and meticulously picked out our calls. But what that means is that over this 30 year time period, we have amassed a wealth of data that has not received the kind of attention that it deserves. 
And at the bottom, you can see if we look at this seasonally, that we actually have a number of years per season over the course of this 30 year period, where we could begin to look at changes in the timing of bowhead whale migration. And if we couple that with images like the ones that have been on these slides of sea ice advance and sea ice retreat and remotely sensed variables, we can begin to get an understanding as what that relationship between climate change and bowhead whales is over the past 30 years. Moreover, and this is important, this research has been done over the past 30 years in very close collaboration with the people of Utkiavik based on questions that they are interested in for their well being and for the well being of their ecosystem. And in working with those teams, we've been able to place hydrophones in areas where we will maximize the likelihood of finding bowhead whales. We're relying on traditional ecological knowledge about the animals in this area, not to mention we're relying or we have relied on the generosity of these villages to help us to deploy instruments through the ice. And ultimately that has allowed us to gather this data set so that we can begin to see what those relationships are. So here's an example of two years of data that we collected near Utkiavik in 2010 and 2011. In each of these years, we deploy several hydrophones, which can then be time aligned. So that calls can both be seen on a spectrogram, but they can also be acoustically localized using a time difference of arrival approach. So that in future studies, when we're doing perhaps a more expanded version of this work, not only will we know when the animals came by, but we'll be able to say within a reasonable margin of error exactly where the animals were when they were calling. This might help us to begin to understand some of those more nuanced questions about why whales do what they do. Are animals countercalling, calling back and forth to one another, which might indicate a contact call? Are singers standing still for the bowhead whale population, indicating that they might be advertising? By looking at fine scale changes in their spatial movements, we can begin to understand a little bit more about call function. And then by understanding what these signals are and how they might change over time, we can begin to understand how the behavior of these animals itself might be shifting in response to climate change. And ultimately, all of this is important because there are cumulative effects of climate change. We're not just losing ice. We're also seeing in increases in anthropogenic noise, shifts in our ecology that might result in interspecies competition. And there are broader impacts than just the bowheads themselves. We need to understand what the impact will be on indigenous communities whose culture, economy, and nutrition rely on the success of this particular ecosystem. And also understanding something about species resilience. Are bowhead whales adaptable? How do they adjust as a function of their changing world? And what we hope to do is to add on to this historic data set, to continue listening to the Arctic Ocean in a meaningful way. And we have several opportunities underway now to try and get hydrophones in the water as early as this spring or next spring. And then ultimately to put all of this under a traditional ecological knowledge framework to work with the a mass of information that the Inupiat communities have been passing down from generation to generation and couple that with what we as scientists know so that we can more effectively manage and co-manage this resource and also enable our communities to have the same resilience that perhaps we might begin to see in our ecosystem. Because ultimately the Arctic is changing. We can't fix that just yet. Understanding undisturbed and disturbed ecology is essential so that we can manage this change. An ecology will tell us something about resilience in this ecosystem, because ultimately it may prove that the whales are less vulnerable to climate change than the communities themselves. And we hope to use our resources and our understanding to cultivate resilience for both. And with that, we would like to thank um, Chris Clark, who was the initial member of CCB, who put those hydrophones down in the water in close collaboration with researchers at the North Slope Borough with the Ice Seal Committee and the whaling teams who did the bowhead whale senses that collected this data over the past 30, 30 coming on 40 years now. All right. Erin and Michelle, thank you so much um, for this really interesting talk. And um, I think it's, it's such a great illustration of um, how migrations shape our world and also how studying migrations um, can tell us something about 
these very interconnected phenomena. So I really appreciate it. And I, um, I'm especially interested in the connections that you trace between um, the biological work that you're doing and the cultural practices. Um, so as we shift into q and I'll just remind the audience that you're welcome to post questions using that Q&A button and we'll be watching there. Um, and um, I'm wondering if I could just get us started. Um, I have two sort of regional questions of my own and I one, um, one has to do with the other part of the bowhead migration. And I wonder if you, um, how you're accounting for um, the parts of their journeys that you that don't appear on the maps that we've seen and what you um, know or speculate about how those journeys are affected as they move um, south. Uh, certainly one complicating factor there is that as they move west across the Chukchi Sea, they're going onto the Russian coasts. And as there have been uh, some political tensions, uh, it, it is a difficult way to do collaborative science across countries. Now, that be, with all that being said, there has been increasing effort um, in, uh, in uh, multinational uh, assessment. So in, uh, a couple of years ago, there were some US scientists that were going over to a couple of the islands uh, off the northern, uh, northeastern coast of Russia to look at the bowhead uh, migration. But that's also one big hole in the story. The other component too, is that up until relatively recently, the Russians were still whaling um, in defiance of some of the, the whaling uh, restrictions. Um, and so that's also uh, a complicating factor. But the Canadians uh, have been really engaged in the effort um, Certainly, uh, and even uh, the oil and gas companies uh, have done a, a, poured a tremendous amount of resources uh, enabling the monitoring science such that they're in, in uh, environmental compliance with either US or Canadian laws. As a follow up to that, we are, have been able to use some remotely sensed resources, particularly looking at things like sea surface temperature and ocean chlorophyll to try and understand more about what is happening at the other end of the bowhead whale migration. And as, um, as Aaron pointed out in some of our earlier slides too, we have amassed um, acoustic data that goes throughout the majority of this particular population, um, most of their migration. Unlike humpback whales that migrate south into the tropics, bowheads are circumpolar. And so they will stay in the Arctic and, and subarctic to a small extent for, for the entirety of their life cycle. And so, while um, we're accustomed to whales sort of falling off the map south, they, they go southeast, but not actually that far. And so some of the understanding that we've had about why it is we might have lost our whales in migration in 2019 has less to do with what was happening actually at Point Barrow and perhaps more to do with what was happening elsewhere. Because we had those really high temperatures in 2019 um, combined with the long daylight hours in the Arctic, it's likely that primary productivity in the Arctic got kickstarted earlier in the year than usual. And as a result, when the whales would typically have to go further north before they would find large enough food supplies in order to adequately be satiated, it's possible that our bowhead whales were late because they were eating. That it isn't that they were late because they were struggling, it's that the buffet had come to them and so the, the journey wasn't worth the effort. And then as those temperatures warmed to the point where um, those prey species continued to move northward, the bowhead whales began their migration a little more typically. And so this year in 2020, we've had a much more normal migration because we didn't see sea surface temperatures and ocean chlorophyll the same way that we saw it in 2019. Thanks for that. And so um, we have two questions coming in. Um, this one from Steve Yellair. Um, do you have any preliminary indications of how climate change is affecting bowhead whales? I guess you've just spoken to this with the in terms of the question of the, I love your comment about the buffet. Um, uh, how climate change is affecting bowhead whales, either their numbers or their migratory patterns. Um, and I might add to that, if you're willing to speculate a little bit more about the relationship between their migration and the ice, um, what your predictions are, or just offer a little bit more detail there, I'd be interested yeah. to hear. So an interesting phenomena that we did observe in 2019 as a result of that loss of sea ice was that the bowhead whale migration was further out to sea than it has been in recorded history. 
So since we did our first bowhead whale senses, and I say our, I wasn't there. Um, but since, since we first started tracking the locations of these animals, both visually and acoustically, the bowhead whale migration is tracked very, very closely with coastal sea ice. In 2019, there was no coastal sea ice. That sea ice didn't form in the same way that it had formed previously. And as a result, our bowhead whales were much further offshore further offshore than they have been um, in recent memory since, since the 1970s. And so I think those are the two big things that we are anticipating is that as resources move and potentially bowhead whales might need to prey shift to something which is not an ice obligate prey, they might start moving into deeper water or into more open water, um, which makes it much more difficult for communities to reach them. And then again, we also expect that we're gonna see a shift in the timing that on our very low ice years, where we have higher temperatures, we would expect to see a later migration. And one of the things that's really wild too is that you have these, uh, there's another uh, stock of bowhead whales in the eastern part of Canada going into Greenland and Iceland, you know, and one of these things where, you know, these animals are hard to track. We don't always understand what they're doing. And so, you know, changes in their distribution, it's unclear whether these are anomalies and outliers or whether this is, you know, a representative of a new, new normal. So I think it was either last year or the year before, where a bowhead whale showed up in Cape Cod Bay. And similarly, a beluga whale, another species of Arctic whale, showed up and was seen off the coast of Rhode Island. So, you know, as, as, as marine mammal scientists, we're like, this doesn't quite feel right. Um, but again, it's the, you know, are these just lone individuals just checking things out? Or are these, you know, you know are, is this the beginning of some sort of lar longer term uh, geographical shift in their distribution? And if that's the case, then, you know, we have profoundly changing oceans. We know the, change, the oceans are changing very dramatically as a function of climate change. Um, and really, I think, you know, we're starting to get a glimpse of sort of what the, what the magnitude that is going to look like. So do those um, potential anomalies, are, are they also complicated to investigate because of the lifespan of the animal? Oddly, no. So for bowheads, that's one of the wonderful things about studying bowheads. Because they can live to be anywhere from 200 to 300 years old, it's likely that we're watching the same whales year after year after year. And so unlike um, if you had a very short-lived species where you might have an anomalous population one year that had some sort of, um, you know, something that was perhaps driven genetically that might alter behavior. Likely what we're seeing is when changes happen in behavior that aren't consistent from year to year, they're a response to something. Um, but for, for bowheads and these sort of deep changes, that's one of the reasons why the data set that we have is so valuable is because we can investigate anomalies in the context of broader ecology. We can investigate anomalies that we might have seen once in 2018. And now we have the resources and the data on hand to go back and say, was there an anomaly in 1987? Was there an anomaly in 1994? Um, so we can begin to pinpoint what is in fact anomalous versus what is an adaptation. And that is absolutely one of our goals is to try and identify what is an example of resilience versus an example of, a, of behavioral plasticity. So baleen whales are incredibly plastic. In fact, all, all cetaceans are, are plastic to a certain extent, but baleen whales in particular and bowheads are very plastic. So given a certain set of environmental parameters, they would go on an exploration. They would have the capacity for trying to maximize foraging, for finding new foraging grounds, which might explain some of these anomalous behaviors that we've seen. What will be interesting will be to see whether or not we can identify anomalies in the past in the way that we'll be looking for them in the future. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, so I'll ask this question that Wendy Wolford has posed also. Um, so uh, she cites an article from the Anchorage Daily News that suggests that the bowhead whale population is increasing under climate change, both in individual size, um, so they're getting fatter, and in community herd size. Is it possible that climate change could result in overpopulation among bowhead whales? And what would the impact of that be on the local communities? I certainly don't think it could result in an overpopulation since bowhead whales have been in this water since prior to the last glacial maximum. The other thing is bowhead whales are actually significantly, they're very sensitive to heat. 
Um, this seems unusual to us because the Arctic is so cold, but bowhead whale blubber is anywhere from two to two and a half feet thick. And in fact, bowheads have to minimize their swim speed in order to make sure that they don't overheat and thus get heat stroke. So I think that there's going to be naturally occurring environmental parameters that would prevent the bowhead whale population from exploding. Um, and similarly, as I mentioned, in the 1940s, we had a population of close to just the Alaska population, not, not the, um, the Greenland population or the Russian population necessarily, but we had a population of close to 20,000 animals. Um, current estimates put us slightly below that. It, I think, I, I don't quote me on this, but I believe our current numbers are somewhere between 12 and 13,000. And so we have a lot of room for growth before we start to hit our pre-whaling numbers. Um, and, and by the time we would start to get that sort of big, big expansion, we're also going to begin to see interspecies competition. Humpback whales are moving into the high Arctic in a way that they never have before. Um, predators to bowhead whales like killer whales are moving into the Arctic in a way that we haven't before. So I, it, I don't think that we would see an overpopulation. Um, I think what we're going to be seeing is an unprecedented shift in ocean ecology and, and how those populations will balance out remains to be seen. And that's not unheard of. We saw very similar phenomena right after industrial whaling when humpback whales moved in and filled the ecological niches of things like fin whales and minke whales and blue whales. Um, so there have been major demographic shifts um, in which whale was you know, the more appropriate given changes either in human behavior or, or environmental behavior. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to shift the conversation to go back to the relationship with indigenous communities. I also really appreciate how you um, highlighted that in your presentation. Um, and we can post the link in a minute to also to that NPR photo essay that you shared with our class, which I thought was great. Um, so we have a question from Blake Martin who says, I was wondering what are the possibilities for preventing the degree to which human induced climate change affects bowhead whales and how are indigenous communities counteracting these resource fluctuations? Hmm. That's, a, that's a hard question. I mean, I think, you know, some, one of the things that has been unique in Alaska compared to the lower 48 is the um, sort of the, the somewhat autonomy, but the authority that Alaskan Native uh, communities have relative to indigenous uh, communities in the lower 48. So it was in the 70s, early 80s, the Alaskan Native corporations were formed. And these are essentially bodies that allow, that are, that are formed uh, on behalf and representing uh, indigenous people. And so if in order to do anything uh, in Alaska uh, on an industrial side, usually there needs to be support of, the, of one, one or more of the corporations, whether that's industrialization, whether that's fishing, whether that's um, you know, s uh, development. So I think in one part, it, the, what that enables is a use and reliance on traditional ecological knowledge in this ecosystem that I don't really think you see to the same degree elsewhere in the US. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's represented elsewhere in the world, um, but it is, does seem to be fairly unique within the US itself. And so getting back to the question, I think with this reliance on uh, traditional ecological knowledge, the Alaskan indigenous communities know that things are changing. Um, they have been anticipating changes. You know, there used to be stakeholder meetings um, when oil and gas was, was active, where, where oil and gas companies would present their plans for the upcoming season, and they would have to get the buy-in and support of the NGO communities, the, the federal regulators, as well as the Alaskan natives. And you would see, you know, Alaskan uh, boat captains just berate these, you know, executives from oil and gas um, companies and saying, look, you know, we, last year was a down year in terms of the number of whales passing. Something is changing. This is not normal. So what that looks like going forward, I don't think we know. I mean, certainly you can imagine that, you know, this is a hard place to live. Um, you know, as Michelle was mentioning, it's, it's expensive. Um, there's not a lot of uh, uh, financial resources as well. So how, you know, what the long-term economic consequences are of, you know, of, of climate change, I don't have a good understanding of what that looks like, but I, I certainly think it is an active topic of discussion um, uh, in Alaska. Yeah. 
One thing that we certainly have seen, and I was recently in Anchorage. Um, I speak annually with the Alaska Ice Seal Committee, um, which includes a lot of the same whaling captains that are on the Bowhead Whaling Committee and the whaling committees that participate in those meetings that Aaron's talking about. And I've heard some pretty, pretty sad stories, really sad stories about um, about grandfathers who took their grandchildren out to areas where they used to go to hunt seals and they used to be able to walk across the ice and then go and wait at a breathing hole and get a seal and that would feed their family for a very long time. And they can't do that anymore, not because there's no seals, but because there is no ice. And so some of the traditional methods that have been used for hunting in the past aren't working anymore. And so one of the questions that those communities have been asking themselves is, do we need to learn a new way of doing what we have been doing for a very long time? And then some of the other questions that they're asking is, do we change what we do? In that particular example, the man who, who could not hunt seals with his grandchildren hunted moose instead. So they went inland and they, and they began to hunt a terrestrial prey and they used that to fill their larder for the winter. And that was an option for that particular family. That's not true in the, in the far north in, in Ukiavik, there are no moose there. Um, and so the question is whether or not subsistence foods, the reliance on terrestrial foods will change, whether or not there will be a switch to doing more fishing and less hunting of marine mammals, whether or not ice seals that are a more coastal species will begin to take up the slack, um, or whether or not the traditional ways will change. But these are all questions that these communities have. And until globally, we begin to make progress or at least to slow the tide of climate change, um, we're unlikely to be able to, on the small scale, make direct changes to prevent the loss of ice in the Arctic. That is a global problem. Uh, it's a global problem and it's a political problem. And so until that advocacy and that global change begins to happen, um, it's a question of how culture can be more resilient and what needs to happen on the cultural side to be more resilient. Thanks. I had... Um... I read something about, and I'm no expert here, so I'm, I'm drawing on an example, I, I think coming from, um, it's a European example about, I'm thinking about traditional practices um, and their, their regulation. Um, and what I read um, suggested that in some cases, um, as um, government regulations sort of allowed for traditional practices to continue, they also um, th thinking again about change, they also sort of forced those traditional practices to remain unchanged. So only mm -hmm. certain um, kinds of equipment and certain kinds of tools and certain kinds of rituals were allowed. Um, and so I wonder if, if, you, if that's also true in, um, in the area that you study, if you could say a little bit more about the, the need to change, but the problem with having to change. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's something that um, is a really interesting topic actually. And that's one of the perks of being formally recognized by the American government as a co-management agency. So the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission works very closely with the IWC, um, with the International Whaling Commission. And so while initially government practices did require traditional methods of hunting, which would mean no outboard engines on boats, you had to hunt everything with a harpoon, you had to pull everything up by hand. In collaboration with ethicists and bioethicists um, at the International Whaling Commission, they actually afforded indigenous communities to um, the permission to adopt the best practices and to minimize the number of strikes that were lost, so animals that were killed but not recovered, and to minimize the suffering of the animal. And in doing so, they allowed them to use modern means of hunting. And so now, instead of being bound to using traditional hunting methods, they are bound to the, um, to the methods outlined by the International Whaling Commission for what is considered an ethical hunt. And in doing so, they actually reduced the number of animals that were struck but lost by a, a really high number. I want to say it was something like 70%. Um, and so most years now, it, it is not, it's not uncommon anyway for them to have all strikes and takes instead of some strikes and losses. And because the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission was formed late, it wasn't until 1981, um, they had already learned, I think, from a lot of mistakes of other native peoples who were dealing with government agencies. 
It's the same reason why Alaska Native formed corporations instead of reservations. There are very few reservations. They didn't um, vie for land, they vied for economic potential. And so in that regard, that has been a very progressive um, element of both the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission and also the Ice Seal Committee. That's really interesting, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so we also got a question um, sent in from one of our participants that I think is um, asking us to exercise our interdisciplinary muscles a little bit here. So the question is, um, if you could talk a little bit how, about how the tools that you use um, might apply to work in the humanities. And I really, um, I'm thinking a lot about the ways that you've already spoken to this in some sense. So. Um, the questions of culture and right now with what you've addressed in terms of bringing ethicists on board um, to think about some of these questions. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how maybe some of the work that you're doing might get taken up by groups who are interested in um, protecting cultural practices or thinking through questions of identity and belonging. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, there is a lot of overlap when we're within the Alaska Native communities between social sciences, between um, anthropology and, and certainly what we do as, as biologists. And one of the best practices that I have been trained to sort of follow is to let the community lead. And there has, you know, particularly as we're seeing changes in, in justice and equity and diversity and inclusivity in our world, um, the concept that as someone who is not a part of that community, my job when I go in and interact with Alaska Native communities in terms of their ecology is to find out what their priorities are and then to use the skills that I have through my formal training to support their priorities. And I think that that particular model is a really powerful one regardless of which discipline that you're in and that in joining um, communities to find out what parts of their culture they are concerned about and what parts of their culture, be it language or art or traditional practices or traditional foods or even just land um, deserve effort and resources that that should be a priority of the communities that we are engaging with. And that has very much changed the research that we have done in the Arctic. As a conservation biologist, my bleeding heart wants to save the whales. Um, as, as a cultural anthropologist, my bleeding heart wants to, say, to, to work with the people. And as it really comes down to it, none of these things are my, are my decisions. My job is to listen to what nature is, is saying and to listen to what the needs of the community are asking for. And those things can work very closely in Congress, but it does have to come from the community. And so when people in Ukiavik say they need jobs, and that's a very important part of the survival of that community. Um, the, the sort of noble savage idea that they are meant to be living in igloos is really very offensive, that they have to be forced to, like you said, abide by a traditional way of life that most modern Americans don't want to abide by. And so by interacting with that community and recognizing the value, for example, of oil and gas, how positive that has been for their communities in providing jobs, which funded their schools, which enabled people to stay home and be a part of that community instead of leaving and moving to larger cities like Anchorage. And so I think acknowledging the needs of the community and, and why they have those needs um, is, a, is a good practice no matter which discipline you're in. Well, and I think the other component too is that you know, with both of these communities as well as you know, outside of, of certainly not just limited to Alaska, you know, using this, this element of sound to listen to and understand the world around us is, is pervasive among really all cultures and communities. You know, even in the lower 48, um, you have indigenous uh, communities, you know, uh, the Menominee in Wisconsin used to, you know, they, their name for the sturgeon was the thunderfish because of the noise that it made during the spawning season, you know, and so I think, you know, one of these aspects uh, of sound as, as bioacousticians were a little bit late to the game, you know, these are communities and people that have been listening to the world around them for millennia, and they understand quite a bit about it. You know, here we show up with our fancy technology, and it's like, oh, look at this. And, the, you know, the, the folks from the indigenous community are like, yeah, we knew that. You know, we don't need your fancy computer to know, to understand this. Um, you know, and so I feel like, you know, there's aspects, then there's things that we can do on the, on the, you know, tech side and the quantitative ecology side that's great, but that also there is very much of a social dynamic here um, that is really unlike what we see in, uh, in sort of natural resource management in other areas um, or around the U.S. or around the world, where I think it's, it's one of the reasons why this work in Alaska um, 
is just has been so exciting. Um, but it's it's unlike many of the other projects we engage in. Thanks so much. Um, I think as a, as a last question, I wonder if you'd be willing to share um, if we want to keep following this work um, or stay tuned to some of these issues, um, what are some recommendations that you have for resources that we could be following or um, even something like a, a book or a film recommendation? I have one book that is extraordinary that I think anyone who is interested in the practice of indigenous whaling should read, and it's beautiful. The book is called The Gift of the Whale. It was published in, I think, 1998 or 1999, and you can still buy it online. Um, it is, um, he's a photojournalist from Anchorage who went and spent several years in Barrow before the name was changed, working with Alaska Native communities, um, documenting the indigenous whaling practice and how important those whales are to their culture and also to their, their lifestyles and livelihoods. And it's a extraordinary documentation of what modern day traditional life in the north of Alaska looks like and the value of these species. It's a really, really lovely one. You can also follow along actually with the North Slope Borough. They post some lovely things on their website, some really interesting things. Um, and they do keep it fairly up to date with the projects that they're working on. And then in terms of Aaron and I's work and how this project unfolds, um, the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics has a blog and we do post updates. We haven't posted one on this project yet, but it will be coming. And as these projects unfold, we try and, and make sure that we disseminate this information as much as possible. And that one actual interesting thing about this particular community is in the North of Alaska, a lot of information is shared person to person and not just through published literature. So while there is a lot of published literature on these topics, and I encourage people to look for that, um, you can also look more closely for, um, you can read the, the Ukiavik newspaper and actually learn a lot about what the whales are doing and they have a daily ice report. Um, and then we also, of course, um, as, as um, good modern Americans, we put things up on Facebook and Twitter and, um, and on all of our different social media methods on how our projects are unfolding as well. Great, Aaron, were you gonna say something? No, Michelle got it. Okay, if, um, well, share that blog post with us also when you, Absolutely. When you post it, that's great. Um, thank you again so much for this really fascinating talk um, and for your time and, and um, what you shared with us today. And I look forward to following, the, following your work and following these issues. Um, and I'll remind our audience that we have um, one more talk as um, Wendy mentioned at the beginning on December 2nd. And we're thinking um, again, and in a slightly different, um, through slightly different lens about climate change with Felice Garip and Nancy Chow um, about climate change, migration, and human adaptation. I'm um, so looking forward to seeing you all then. Um, thanks again to our speakers and also to you and our audience. See you all soon. Thanks. Yeah.